Hi, this is Rahiman Sheikh. Welcome to Fortnightly Railway Transportation Systems Podcast. I am the host and railway systems specialist working in this industry for 24 years and counting. This podcast is primarily focused on railway experts who have vast amount of experience and contributed greatly to this amazing industry. This is not a technical seminar, but focuses on feel-good stories, individual journeys, their success and failures, motivating younger generation to kickstart their career in railways and creating a sense of pride for the railway people who devoted their lives on the most environment-friendly public transportation. Our guest for this fortnight is Mark Wilde, ex-Chief Executive Officer at Crossrail Limited UK. Mark is an engineer with honors bachelor's degree in electrical and electronic engineering and master's in business administration from Leeds University. Mark started his professional career in 1987 with Northern Electric in various positions. A versatile senior leader with over 35 years experience in the infrastructure sector working across numerous large-scale operational and major program areas, including strategic development and transformation. Having spoken with some of Mark's previous employees, I gather he is a motivational, energetic manager who leads from the front great experience in both public and private sectors, proven track record, in many international jurisdictions. Hi, Mark. Welcome to Railway Transportation Systems Podcast. Thank you for joining and taking time out for sharing your insights with us on early UK summer morning. Yeah, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for the invite. Yeah, nice sunny morning here in London for once. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks, Mark. Here in Sydney, it's winter. Today morning, it was fully covered with fog. And there's less than five meters visibility. And uh, today, 21st June, is the shortest day of the year. Nine hours, 53 minutes, sunlight, daylight. The longest day here. <laughs> <laughs> Before I start, Mark, can you tell us your professional journey story, please? Yeah, so um, I'm an engineer, I electrical engineer. So I joined the electricity industry, actually, when I graduated, my local electricity company, which at that time was nationalized. And as a lot of people know, kind of Margaret Thatcher privatized the industry within about five years of me joining. So yeah, I spent the first 15 years of my career in the regulated and non-regulated electricity business. Kind of found my way into the railways by the year 1999. And uh, I've loved it ever since. So, you know, I got the railway bug like a lot of people did. Yeah. Um, when did the project Ended up in Westinghouse, which was part of Invensys, at that time the world's biggest signaling company. So people think of me as some kind of signaling person. I, I'm an electrical engineer that ended up in signaling. Ended up running Westinghouse. Uh, then I worked for Talos for a couple of years, uh, re-signaling the Jubilee line. Uh, then I came to Australia. I had a brilliant time in Australia, in Melbourne, with the establishment of Public Transport Victoria became the CEO of PTV, uh, came back came back to London to run the Tube, be uh, the managing director of London Underground, which was, I've got to say, my dream job, and then which was going pretty well. And then, unfortunately, as a lot of people know, Crossrail got into a lot of trouble in 2018, and I was on the board, I was the client of Crossrail, and um, it imploded. And I, for the past three or four years, I've been delivering Crossrail, and I'm very pleased to say that the Elizabeth Line, which was the output of Crossrail, opened a month ago. So um, I've had an interesting journey, put it that way. It's been very enriching, and I've learned a lot on the way. Incredible, incredible success, Mark. You know, the Elizabeth Line opened on 24th May, 2022. Did your phone stop ringing? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was... Um, I've got to say, in my career, there is nothing like Crossrail and opening the Elizabeth line. The highs and lows. So on the day of opening, I mean, the week before, we managed to get Her Majesty the Queen to give us the royal seal of approval, and the excitement just built. So on, on the day of opening, I've got to say, it was absolutely insane. You know, the not just the Gunzels, but the whole city and the country meant a lot. So, yeah, it's... Um, a very emotional 
day, actually. And the good news is that in the four weeks since we've opened, we've had pretty flawless reliability. And there's kind of a story there we should talk about as well, which was our biggest worry that we'd open it and it would end up with a Terminal 5. People know about Heathrow's Terminal 5, which famously opened in a disastrous day. Luckily, that hasn't happened to us. 20 years, 100 kilometers, reading to Heathrow. It's an amazing project. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, uh, I know you have shared this a couple of times, but can you give us an overview of Crossrail project? Because most of them outside UK have only high-level information like the Elizabeth Line is London's newest railway line and it will add 10% to more capacity and to the central London's rail network and generate an estimated of pound 42 billion to the UK economy. But... People would love to, are keen to hear key insights from you about this historic development. Yeah, well, let's just talk for a couple of minutes on why this project matters. Why why is it such a big deal? And it's a new east-west railway underneath London, 25 to 35 metres underneath London, running east to west, west to east, 21 kilometres of twin bore tunnels. Tunnels are nearly seven metres uh, wide in the in diameter, so it's a new tube line, I suppose. But the the key thing about Crossrail and what became the Elizabeth Line, a bit like the RER in Paris, it is a metro, high intensity metro line with full platform screen doors, twenty four trains an hour. But it's super size. It's the size of suburban trains. You know, twenty five thousand volts, full size trains, trains that will carry fifteen hundred to two thousand people. And crucially, this pipe underneath London connects the Great Western Railway out to Heathrow and Reading, the historic railway that Brunel built, and of course the railway in the Great Eastern, the railway from Liverpool Street out to a place called Shenfield. So it, it, this pipe in the middle is really a metro line. It's a new metro line, you know, London's 11th metro. But more than that, it connects two large suburban intercity lines. And it, it, it's kind of a bit like the RER or the S-Bahn, but it's supersized. And that's why it makes a big difference in London. So instead of people getting on big trains to come into Termini to get on the little tube trains, you you go straight through. And it is a tube line as well. So, you know, 10% boost of London's transport capacity in one go, 1.5 million people brought within 45 minutes of the central uh, economic zone of London. We've halved journey time because this train travels at 100 kilometers an hour underneath London, twice the speed, twice the side of a tube line. So, you know, Paddington, if you know the geography of London, Yep. Paddington to Liverpool Street's like nine minutes. So we've dramatically reduced uh, the size of London. And overall, although it's cost us £20 billion, there are £42 billion of agglomerated benefits. And this railway, interestingly, this railway has been planned since 1840, which uh, the canal companies worked out after the first railway, 1830, Liverpool to Manchester. Wouldn't it be great to build a, a railway between the Paddington Basin in the west and the Tilbury Docks in the east? So this railway has been planned for over 100 150 years, and it's taken 22 years in this incarnation. And why is it difficult? Well, London's the most difficult city in the world to do this. Um, you've got to cross the river. The geology in the river goes from clay to sand. 2,000 years of archaeology here since Julius Caesar. And, of course, we've got big skyscrapers and a historic legacy tube that's quite deep. That's why Crossrail and Elizabeth Line is, is such a big deal in this country. And globally, and I guess the thing we should talk about is it's also the world's most advanced digital railway. It's probably the state of the art of digitization. And there is a story that we should maybe talk about. Wow, dazzling. I wish I could have been a part of it. 20 years. Many people might have built their career over here on this project. Yeah, I mean, um, first time it appeared on the London Rail map as a proposal was 1974. So, you know, whatever, the 48 years ago. And uh, attempts in the 80s and 90s to get this up and running. But yeah, this started in the year 2000, 22 years ago, and it got its royal assent in 2008. So the construction period has been 14 years and um, yeah, an, an epic endeavour. 75,000 people have worked on it. More than half of them never came to London. So this is not only a UK PLC job. You know, this is a global job. You know, the signalling came from Braunschweig in Germany. You know, the, the trains were built in Derby in the UK. 
you know, the technology came from Stockholm. So it's a, it, this is a real global job, actually. At its time, it was the biggest job in Europe and the fifth biggest infrastructure job in the world. So this, you know, you forget how now it's finished, how significant this job actually was. Intense, very intense. I know you might be feeling it's good you've completed this great, amazing project. But at the same time, you feel sad that that excitement has come to an end. Well, I did it all myself, of course. You know? <laughs> no, I don't know. No, I mean, I, I think of it a little bit differently. That I'm one person out of seventy-five thousand. It was a great honor to be at the end of this job and lead it. The so no, I, I think it more about I was lucky to be there and what an honor to almost like you're leading this army over the line and what an honor to carry the flag over the line with me and my team. So no, I don't, I don't feel sad at all. I I feel elated and proud of the women and men who built it. That's what I feel. And I think it'll stand the test of time. Yeah, so no, no sadness isn't in my um, emotions, but pride for the people is. Amazing. So Mark, uh, as we discuss about the project, I just want to know what are those top five key lessons learned from the various projects in your career, not just Crossrail? Yeah, well, you know, I've had a long career in projects. And I think the interesting thing for me about Crossrail, for me personally, it kind of crystallized and brought together my whole career insights. And I'm, I think there is something quite profound, because let's be honest, Crossrail got into a lot of trouble in 2018. As much as I've pumped its tires up as the greatest project that the world's ever seen. In 2018, we've got to remember, in 2018, we were meant to open this railway in December 18. And in July of 18, six or seven months to go, we thought we might have a, like a, a few months problem and might need another 100 million quid. And then the project collapsed. And it was revealed we had a three-year problem and we needed another four billion pounds. So there was, in 2018, a black hole in the middle of this project. And as my ex-boss, Tony Meg says, Crossrail was the greatest program in the world until it wasn't. <laughs> so, so I think the lessons are interesting. And I, so I've picked out five things, really. I think if I was a major programs leader or I was a board member, or I was on a chair, I was in an audit committee, or I was a, a chief engineer. What would I take from Crossrail? And I thought, is it worthwhile that I go through my five lessons? Would that be helpful, do you think? Yep. Right. Yep. So, the first one is fixed end debt. So, Crossrail fixed its end date the 9th of December 2018, many years previously. And that was a bad mistake, you know. A project like this had immense, immense uncertainty. You know, driving the tunnels underneath London was a very, very risky affair, which happened to be done very successfully. And the second risk was this huge digitization. You know, nobody had ever digitized anything on this scale before. There are 16 million parts of Crossrail in the digital world, kind of the equivalent of two nuclear submarines. So nobody ever attempted this. 30 meters below London. So fixing an end date, I think, drove all sorts of interesting behaviors and ultimately created a culture where people felt that date couldn't be challenged in an unconscious conspiracy of silence. And it was really unconscious. There was nobody suppressed any information here. But for some reason, we lost our reality. And if high performance is staying really ambitious, but really realistic. I think, unfortunately, the fixed end date meant we remained ambitious, but we lost our sense of reality. So first lesson for me is never fix the end date so aggressively. And, you know, at one point, Crossrail started to convince itself, and I was on the board, I'm not blameless in this, the fixed end date drove a lot of strange culture where the truth wasn't visible to people. So that's the first thing. Should always plan in windows you know, windows of time. Drive the team internally on the aggressive front edge, but make sure the stakeholders around you have a downside risk that they can communicate and, and back. Then the second thing for me is about design modularity. We did a lot of integration actually at the core face, sometimes with 8,000 people 30 meters below London integrating. So really, we should have done a lot more in the factory. You know, we started off in Crossrail with a concept of modularization of the equipment, standard product. Unfortunately, mostly driven by the fixed end dirt, when the pressure really came on and the client design was slipping, the concepts of modularity, plug and play, building things in factories really got lost. So I think, unfortunately, the when the pressure came on, driven by the fixed end date, we lost our ability to modularize and think about design. 
So my, my second lesson is modularity at all sense. Easier to build something in a factory, about 10 times more complex and more expensive to build at 30 meters below length. So uh, modularity, n- number two. Uh, n- number three for me is it had the right risk at the right time. And Crossroad had two real dominant risks. It had, firstly, the, the tunneling drive underneath London. And secondly, it had this huge digitization. Unfortunately, the tunneling drive was expertly done but pretty much the same team continued to do the digital, which was really bad mistake. So just like I'm not a sports fan, really, but it looks like an American football team have um, different players, don't they, for different bits of the game. Really, the whole team should have pivoted to a more systems integration sort of activity. So right risk at the right time. And that takes a lot of courage to swap team members to say your bit's done. And I think that's, that's kind of a profound lesson, really. We had the wrong team dealing with it. Bent Flyberg of Oxford talks about this quite extensively, about cognitive bias, that human beings, particularly project people, if you give them a task, they're going to really go for it. So be very careful, like a tuning fork, tuning the wrong people to the wrong activity. So num- number three, major civils, IT, very different things. Number four for me is this idea of integration and system integration. The that really system integration is a an active thing. You know, it people talk a lot about owning the you know system engineering. Now Crossroad had the world's best system engineering, but it still failed. And it failed because all the individual constituent parts had ownership of their part and were working collaboratively to bring it together. What I tried to do when I took over was the opposite. Everybody to own the whole of the system and then everybody's in service to the whole. And the whole of the system is the woman or man driving the train, the person operating the platform, the person in the control room. So instead of like a coalition of parts trying to come together, building this jigsaw piece, let's start with the jigsaw piece. So the my fourth lesson really is about the very interesting topic of a systems approach. Now that needs to be embedded at the beginning, it needs to be enduring, and we can talk about what systems really mean. My final lesson, and I won't surprise anybody to say this, my final lesson is the human element of, can you create a culture where the gaps, the, the things that are wrong, can be made visible without the fear of failure or fear. And what I've learned in Crossrail is failure is an intrinsic part of success in something so risky. So you need to create the culture of human beings being able to collaborate, work together without fear. And of course, back to my very first lesson, the thing that drove most fear in Crossrail was the prospect of losing an end date that had become, I guess you might say, a sacred cow, if people know what that metaphor might be. It's something that people thought couldn't be changed, distorted the behavior of the people. So they're, they're my kind of lessons, and I think if you look at them, they're generally in the genre of the client taking a more sophisticated systems and human approach to this rather than a more traditional engineering approach. I don't know, what do you think? Does that resonate with you? Wow, it's it's amazing, Mark. I think these le- key lessons learned, uh, I feel as if I'm sitting in front of my lecturer and taking notes in a institution. All your lessons learned are applicable for all the projects across the world and not just railways. So to summarize the five lessons are fixed end dates, deadly system integration is vital, design modularity, focus on the right risk at the right moment, and human element. I would say, you said it's amazing. Yeah, I've learned a lot and I think that they're good insights, but they're not exactly, you know, I haven't invented something. I'm not Isaac Newton, am I? I haven't invented the concept of gravity. Yeah. I think the important thing is, could the conditions be created where people can bring those lessons forward? Now, to me, the most important lesson of all of those is the human one. The, the fixed end date did get fixed, but clearly it was a mistake. And in 2014, the client design was running late by about six months. Instead of just stopping and saying, right, everybody just stop while we stabilize the client design, which would enable modularity, the problem is nobody felt the courage to be able to say, well, that could threaten the end date. So I think the, the big lesson for programs, particularly mega programs, is can the authorizing environment, the politicians, the boards, can they create the environment for professionals to be truthful and courageous? And now that's difficult in an environment where public money's been sent 
on billions of pounds and dollars, billions, you know, for 20 billion pounds on Crossrail, we've overrun by 4 billion. It's only 27%, but for 4 billion, how many hospitals could you build? You know, a lot. I think that's the issue, you know, can the environment around programs, can the conditions be created for people to be truthful and courageous? That isn't easy. And it went wrong on Crossrail. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, you bring such a great importance points in front of us. When you say these fixed end dates are deadly and you speak about windows, how much that window could be? Because in projects, wherever I worked, we always worked on dates. And, and in some of the project directors I have seen, they put a calendar out there, some run a clock in reverse. So when, But your approach is very different. You talk about windows, how big these windows can be. Yeah, well, uh, I will answer that, but uh, I'll give you another mental model or uh, just a model to think about where Crossrail got trapped, and it's related to windows and how big these windows are. And I think Crossrail for a long time lived in the house of risk. And what do I mean? I mean, for a long time, Crossrail was thinking about the mountain ahead, the mountain range it had to climb ahead. It could see it in the distance. Everything I've said was in their risk registers, but their risk mitigations were becoming increasingly fantastical to keep the window narrow, i.e. the singular end date. Really, they needed to live in the house of intervention. So instead of writing a risk mitigation that, you know, system integration might be a challenge, let's write a mitigation. Why didn't they intervene in it? So I think the first thing to say about narrowing of windows is you've got to live in a state of intervention rather than risk registers. I won't tell you which program it is, but I'm, I'm a non-executive on an existing major program here in the UK. And I looked at the risk register yesterday and it was the old story. It was a, all the risks were there, but the mitigation was written about something in the future that somebody else would have to deal with. So to answer your question, I think the art of major program management is to have an early date and a late date. And the prospect is to progressively narrow the windows, to drive the team realistically to the front edge, to be aspirational, you know, kind of P20, P30 in program terms, right? whilst at the same time having the authorizing environment relying on a date that might be more P80. So the art of major program management is to start to narrow these windows. So these windows could start quite wide. You know, the real window for Crossrail's opening at the very beginning was probably two years. And it was probably 10 years ago, if you were thinking about a picture, it was probably 100 pixels. You know, it was probably quite rough and the window might be two years. Now, as you progress through it, you go from 100 pixels to a megapixel to a trillion pixels of high definition. And the art of major program management is to narrow the windows as the picture becomes much more um, granular. And I think that is the art of major program management. And of course, it isn't just the end date. It's all of the intermediate milestones. The key thing is, though, that the internal team have debts that are ambitious but realistic. And I, you know, I've had a few, pro I've run a few programs in my time where we started with P0, forward-leaning programs, where, and I think that they didn't really work. You know, a program, program internal teams that keep losing. If you keep losing, you've got to have some wins, but you've got to have the ability to win and lose. And that means the front edge of the debt's probably got to be P20, P30. At the other end of the extreme, the stakeholders have got to be able to rely on a debt, but it's not like 10 years away. So this is all about living in intervention mindset rather than a risk mindset, starting with the windows probably between P20 and P80, driving the teams hard to the front edge. And as the picture of the project becomes more uh, granular, as it becomes high definition, you know, a million pixels, yeah. then the job of major programs and boards is to narrow the window. And eventually, I mean, the bottom line is uh, four weeks to go with opening the Elizabeth line, our window was three weeks. So a T minus four weeks, to open, we had a window of three weeks because we didn't have a certain safety certification from the fire brigade and our reliability wasn't where we are. A week later, at T minus three, it had narrowed to one week. And at one week, we backed a debt. So that was a really good example. And I was very lucky to have a boss called Andy Byford, who is the commissioner of London. Andy was very experienced. We'd worked with him for years. He'd been in Toronto. He'd been in New York. And he knew that the minute we declared a debt, we were going to be judged on it publicly. And not just the first day, the next day, the day after. So T minus four, it was four weeks. T minus three, it had narrowed to one week and we went for it. 22 years it took to narrow the window to one week. Amazing so answer. It was fantastical to think anybody could have picked a date Correct. 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Courageous. That's really courageous. 
Mark, uh, my next question is, uh, you know, I did a bit of research uh, before this podcast on you and I spoke to a lot of people who worked under you previously and I've been reliably informed that one of the things that has come to define your approach is systems thinking. Can you tell us about it, please? Yeah, I'm a very mediocre electrical engineer. I'm a chartered engineer, but yeah. you, wouldn't want, you wouldn't want to trust me to do the uh, electrical engineer in the minute. But very quickly in my career, I, I started to think about the integration of engineering to the whole. And so I guess in my, in my whole life, I've thought of systems rather than individual disciplines. And you know, my foray into railway signaling kind of really reinforced that. And obviously, railway signaling is one of the ultimate systems approaches, particularly when you get to kind of automated railways. Yeah. So I guess it was always in me. And now, I think now, I think the big thing of Crossrail, I kind of go back to my metaphor before. If you think of Crossrail as a thousand-piece jigsaw piece, all jumbled up at the start, the only way to bring that into coherence is to start with the picture, isn't it? It, it isn't possible, and Crossrail's kind of proven this, it isn't possible for the individual jigsaw pieces to form themselves easily. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a big biologist, but I do know a bit about entropy, and I think these huge systems Systems, these mega systems like Crossrail are quite entropic. And what do I mean by that? Well, ent entropy, for people who know it, will tend to chaos. You know, systems that tend to chaos. So I think systems like Crossrail of mega complexity have high entropy and they will eventually tend to chaos if they are not controlled. So systems to me are this concept of owning the whole, where everybody is committed fully to the success of the whole, not just their individual jigsaw piece or the jigsaw pieces that are adjacent. And people often ask me, what's the difference between collaboration and owning the whole? And collaboration, to me, is like a baton pass in a relay. You know, one runner's passing a baton, you know, delivery passing a baton to, to the um, operations team. Crossrail, to me, was much more of a tough mudder obstacle course, where everybody had to cross the line together. And if somebody got stuck in the mud behind, we had to go back and get them, because we could only cross the line together. And that was a massive shift in thinking in Crossrail from a baton pass where the delivery team couldn't quite get it in the hands of the operator because of requirements and systems thinking would be, right, we're all going to cross this line together, no matter what. Nobody's going to get left behind. Now, that's important because at the end of the day, a driver, you know, the minute on Crossrail, the driver has to cope with about 20 operational workarounds, things that aren't quite right, about 20. It's 20 things an operator has to do at the front of a train to make sure that the train works, that are beyond the compliance of what the system said it would do. 20 things. Now, obviously, those 20 things have to be a certain number. Otherwise, the driver, it isn't safe for the driver. But we know this is very safe. We started at one point with well over 500 things that were wrong for the driver. And obviously, a driver can't cope with 500 things that are wrong. So this process of systems thinking to me is beyond having a shadow operator and people having a collaborative work set. It is thinking of the woman or the man in front of the train and working collaboratively and knowing none of us can leave until it kind of gets to that point. So that's, that's kind of what I think of as systems thinking, often mistaken by system engineering, which is a complex component of systems thinking, but systems thinking is somewhat bigger. What do you think? Does that, does that resonate with you? It does. It does. I, I was in a wow mode. It's such a brilliant and clear idea. It looks, when you're explaining it, it looks like a common sense. Yeah, we need to do that. But uh, how many projects really do that? Well, I think the thing that goes wrong, and this is the difficult bit, I mean, <laughs> it's the difficult yeah. bit. The difficult thing is how do you contractually activate that where risk is moved from the client to, you know, you know, state governments are spending billions of pounds and they're in a bargain with the supply chain. And in Crossrail, another lesson, I suppose, Crossrail broke it into 37 parts. So Crossrail, actually, although these were big programs, you know, um, 100 to 500 million pound projects, there were 37 jigsaw pieces contractually, all with a risk transfer. And, and I think the key thing for activation of systems thinking is to not transfer risk to the supply chain, system integration risk that the supply chain can't cope with. Very profound lesson. Because the minute you start to get shareholders' money on the hook for system integration risk that the client should be dealing with, behaviors start to change. So it does make sense, but the, the probably 
fundamental thing to think about for clients is how they have strike a bargain with the supply chain where they move enough risk to incentivize them, but they don't move so much of the jigsaw piece putting together that it distorts the concepts of owning the whole. Really quite profound. And when I I was looking in Crossrail that when I took over, I took every risk back in. You know, I took all the risk away from the supply chain, apart from, you know, their basic quality you know, making sure that they delivered a quality product. I took all the integration risk back in and that unlocked the ability to own the whole. Yep, I did. I spoke to a couple of your team and they all are in a great appreciation about you and about your leadership. So even my next question is, especially regarding leadership, you know, what is the most important values you demonstrate as a leader, Mark? Well, number one, beyond everything else, is safety. So I be very suspicious of any program that doesn't have a true and authentic safety culture. And that means, you know, as a minimum, it's starting every meeting with safety. But, you know, it, it's beyond that. It's, you know, as, so as CEO, I was really very lucky to have Howard Smith as COO and Jim Crawford as program director. And both of those individuals are true, authentic safety leaders. And we would spend 20% of our time, at least, on safety. And it's not just occupational safety, it's psychological safety and mental safety of the team. So number one, values, it's got to start with safety. I don't believe a true systems approach could come together if you didn't want everybody to go home healthy every day. Then I think after that, it's values-wise, two things I would say. Um, Firstly, transparency. Got to have the ability to have everything on the table you know everything all the gaps have to be on the table and you see so many watermelon projects eh? green on the outside red on the inside so once you've got safety culture next thing is ultra transparency because i found by shining a light onto things people could work together to overcome so if you said look there are icebergs out there and we know there's a massive iceberg about a thousand kilometers ahead of us but we don't know whether it's you know there's a 20 degree spread about where that iceberg could be but it's there and it could sink us people's attitudes would change to say we're not going to be interested in icebergs because that would be bad news would be really bad because crossrail actually ran into an iceberg in the end. So number two, the transparency. And we spoke about number three. Number three is the um, the spirit of uh, working together. It's, it's something beyond collaboration. It's something in the area of encouraging people to see the whole, valuing that. So at every moment when you see somebody not owning the whole, it's kind of calling that out. And so there's no place for bullying. There's no place for aggression. There's no place for um, machismo. This is a place for inclusivity different types of people, all different types of people, different genders, different backgrounds, different ages, you know, I think so. There would be my, my kind of three things. Intrinsic safety, got to start the ultra transparency and this concept of all the talents working together in a spirit of kindness and inclusivity, I think is the key for future major programs. I think if you get any of those three wrong, you're in deep, deep trouble. Deep agreed, trouble. agreed. This is one of the key, le- I never heard about this new thing, uh, like working together. I heard this word, but collaboration always i was thinking about collaboration and all someone going behind someone is lacking behind we step back go back and bring him to the speed these are some amazing thoughts i really learned from you mark thanks for sharing that and the following question as well is it is related to this what traits do you look for when assembling a leadership team um firstly uh, you're looking for a mix you know you're looking for a good gender mix you're looking for a good um, ethnic mix. You're looking for uh, a good age range. So, you know, the you, you're looking for really, um, you know, a very variable team with its backgrounds. It's, you know, you, you do not want homogeneity, if that's a word, you know. You don't you don't want everybody to be the, of one type of person. You know, stereotypically, that ends up in projects like we've had with kind of white middle-aged guys who are from a civil engineering background. But... To be fair to that group of people, I think the same thing would occur if you had another sort of sector of people. So first thing I'm looking for in leadership teams is to jumble it up. Then I'm looking really mo- mostly for attitude. You know, obviously they get there on merit, don't they? These It's a given that these people get there because they've got the skills, you know, and... Uh, that's the art of getting the variable team, of course. You definitely do not want tick box 
just putting their tokenism, that would be a disaster. So everybody's got to get there on their merits. So assuming it's a variable team, different attributes, and they're all there on merit, the thing I'm looking for is um, that, that spirit to do the things that we've said together. And I think, you know, there's two types of people in this world. There are can't people and yeah. want people. So people who can't do things, I'm okay with. I'm okay because we can learn together. People who want to do things and have an ego, I have less time for. So the, the principal trait I'm looking for are people who can remove their ego and personality from the task. That's what you're looking for. Now, that's quite difficult because to, have to, to survive in these environments, which are very intense, you've got to have some kind of ego. So it's kind of that you're trying to make sure that the, the worst case is you get a, a clique of people who've got quite dom dominant sort of personalities. And I think that's where you start to get the lack of transparency and the kind of watermelon effect. So yeah, yeah different types of people, all there on their merits, uh, lacking egos, all wanting to work together. And I've got to say, the win of Crossrail, the euphoric win, it's like winning the World Cup. Not that I've ever won the World Cup, but it's like winning the, it's like winning the World Cup. And I've got to say, the people who've come on this journey, their euphoria at delivering it and how we did it is utterly off the scale. And um, I think they've been given something that I, I wish other people could share. And they've done it the right way. I think that, that mattered. The way they did it. Total football. That's what the Dutch would say, wouldn't they? Total football. So it was total project management. <laughs> what an answer, Mark. Uh, to be honest, I'm searching for words because I'm so moved by your answer, especially that can't and won't. Uh, wow. I don't, do you think? Do you, do you agree? I mean, I, you must I meet people who are can't. That's okay. And but won't. People who won't. Yeah. yeah. Because uh, that's the reason I was just blown away with that answer and I didn't know how to respond it because many, many times I have seen that font and can't people and unfortunately won't people find ways to get their things done. Yeah, wow. yeah. I mean, I think the important thing is want people. Just be very, very careful you don't poison your well. It doesn't take much to poison yes. your well. And um, yeah, be very careful about that, particularly in a world of this mega complexity. You really do need to have some consistency in that. Yeah. Hey, Mark, going forward, explain a time when you had to make a decision without all relevant facts. This is a <laughs> common challenge in major projects. Yeah. So I think, well, first of all, you know, this concept of windows is very important because if you have space, you know, you're talking about uncertainty. And on something like Crossrail, there is great uncertainty. You know, the signaling system, which is three types of signaling system, and it's the classic TPWS legacy system. It's ETCS at the Heathrow Tunnel, and it's what's called CBTC, automatic train operation in the core. So you've got three signaling systems that had, that had never been done in the world before. So it's greatly highly uncertain research and development. So the first thing is the Windows concept is important to, to create the space for decisions to be made correctly. So, you know, I, my answer is predicated that people think in Windows and uncertainty is, is something that people talk about. So how do you make decisions in uncertainty? Well, I, it's more like the best way I could describe it is Crossrail, I think, before my leadership, they did loads of brilliant stuff, by the way, particularly in the civil engineering phase. But they would kind of think about climbing Everest almost in two leaps. Bang, bang, bang. You know, that was highly uncertain to climb Everest in two leaps. What we've done is we've we've kind of climbed Everest 10 meters at a time. And what does that mean in practice? It means incremental decision making, really. So take the software. We've then generally worked incrementally and brought everybody up to the same configuration. Something called like a plateau is what we used. And so instead of trying to get the trend software and the signaling software in two big leaps, actually there's been 50 incremental steps. So that's the first thing in, in uncertainty. If there's a group of you uncertainty, just keep going in smaller incremental steps and you can get there. The second thing we did in construction was to really focus on productivity. So, you know, our productivity used to be about 25 to 30% because we were in the tunnel, train testing and construction at the same time very disruptive. So we decided, or my program director decided, we would blockade the railway. We'd block it up. So we would create access periods of two weeks, 
and we blitz it. Then we do train testing. Now that takes a lot of preparation, uh, but it was very successful. It raised our productivity to 90%. So the two things I think about with uncertainty, assuming you've got the air cover of Windows, are incremental decision-making, particularly in complexity like software, climb the mountain 10 meters at a time, making sure everybody's at the next kind of plateau, never leave somebody like 10 plateaus behind because you'll never get them back again. And the second thing is for bulk work, really, really focus on getting just getting the work done. Again, living in the house of intervention, not the house of risk. So instead of writing a risk that says our productivity might reduce and then some clever risk mitigation, no, no, intervene in it and blitz it. And I think those two things, climbing the software mountain and assurance mountain incrementally, at the same time of getting the work done, lead you to narrowing of the window. And I guess this took us a while, took me a whole year to work that out, that we could only, it would take 50 software jumps to get to the top of the mountain. That was a, a profound realization. And you also realize that to, at each plateau, there might have been three or four parties that had to be on the plateau, the doors, the vent, the um, the train, the signaling. They all had to climb the software mountain 10 meters at a time. Quite a profound realization that, which meant we had to completely change the team to be experts in configuration management. Yep, agreed. So Mark, because when you speak about signaling, I'm very interested in signaling get attracted towards signaling. So as we speak, the purple line is operational. So we have three types of signaling now. So TPWS, CBTC, and what's the other? ETCS. ETCS. Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, probably, you know, it's a classic case, you know, 10 years ago, the, the we needed automatic operation in the central core with platform screen doors. So kind of what you have in, you know, London Underground and in Hong Kong. Drivers attending, it's great of automation too. All the drivers doing is opening the doors. So we needed that functionality in the central core because, you know, you can't manually drive that intensity and keep the door alignment right. And 10 years ago, 12 years ago, the only technology that would do that was CBTC. So we've ended up with three signaling systems. <laughs> yeah. Now, interestingly, now ETCS, I think in Brisbane, the Cross River Rail in Brisbane, yep. they've got ETCS with ATO with platform screen doors. So a good example where was that even the right call 12 years ago? Why didn't we just go for ETCS with ATO? But, you know. Yeah, it's time. Yeah, well, I was in the, um, it's very hard to criticize people 12 years ago. I was working for Talos 12 years ago when that decision was made. And we made a offer to Crossrail that we could do ETCS, ATO uh, with platform screen doors, but it never been done before in the world. And the judgment was the, it would be better to do this amalgamation of three systems and have the complicated bit in the middle. Now, as it's transpired, the really complicated bit was to have three signaling systems. And we probably should have gone for ETCS with ATO with platform screen doors. And I think when Crossrail 2 happens, hopefully that'll happen over the next few years, which is like the north-south version of Crossrail, I think they've already decided that will be ETC ATO with platform screen doors, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Mark, uh, my next question is about is also on uh, a question to successful leaders, especially for people like me or even the younger graduates. This is the common question which we would like a feedback or, or directions from people like you. So it's how do I grow and how do I manage risk? Yeah, I mean, if you take me, so I'm 57. I think I've had a successful career, you know. And I come from the northeast of England, a working class guy. I come from Newcastle. I didn't do very well in my school exams. I went to a polytechnic, like a technical college rather than a university. So how is it that I got here to the top? And I, I would think, I would think three things have really occurred to me. Firstly. Um, I've been very lucky. <laughs> I've been at the right place at the right time. But to create that look, you've got to really spread yourself around. So this idea of saying yes to things, you know, when, when I was in the electricity industry and we got privatized, I, I just got interested in the non-regulated business. And it was quite risky then to do things like that. So First thing is you make your own look and you make your look by dotting around, you know, different jurisdictions, different sectors, different projects. Uh, second thing is, I think, is a sponsorship network that I've been very, very fortunate that I've had the sponsorship of about five to ten 
people throughout my career that I would say are really exceptional people. And even now, I think I'm a you know, relatively senior person now, even now I, I'm sponsored by some people that I really rate. You know, and people still advocate for me who are around. You know, and there are obviously different types of people now than when I was a 21-year-old. So number two for me is got to get that sponsorship network. And certainly, you know, at any one time, I mentor three or four people. Somebody listening to this podcast might reach out to me <laughs> and say, would I mentor them? And I would, but you know, I can only do three or four people at a time. And so number two for me is sponsorship. And the third thing is I, I really think the way to get on is to have that spirit of humility and be quite humble. And, you know, so they're, they're my three things. You make your own luck. So say yes to a lot of different things. Build a sponsorship network, people who will advocate for you. Very important, particularly if you are from a different ethnicity or you're a woman. You know, if you're in a minority of the pool, very important that sponsorship occurs. And I know people in my peer group are active sponsors. And I guess the third thing is how you go about that is to be humble. And there's no real place for egocentricity and autocratic leadership anymore. Um, the future leaders will be humble, inclusive, kind. They'll be sophisticated thinkers. They'll be hum- They'll think about the human element. So if you have those three things, plus, of course, you've got the chops, you know, <laughs> intellectual chops, which, you know, most people have, I think your career will succeed. I think if you do the opposite of those three things, you, you'd have a problem. But I've just been kind of lucky to get here, but I've somewhat made my own luck, maybe. But it's been a series of fortunate coincidences that I'm here. I think you should tell this lucky story to your wider community as well. Uh, apart from this podcast, I heard uh, you doing a legacy, learning legacy tour from 11th to 22nd of July. Uh, do you know which places, Mark? Yeah, well, first of all, I'm brilliant to come back to Australia. I love Australia. I, I, I never thought I'd leave Melbourne in 2016 until the job in London Underground came up. And of course, you can't turn the opportunity down to run the tube, can you? So, And then I ended up in Crossrail. So it's great to be back in Australia. So it's Public Transport Association. Association. Um, it starts on the 9th of July, ends on the 23rd of July. I think the centerpiece is um, on the 15th of July, there is a, an actual event in Melbourne that people can see on the PTA uh, ANZ uh, website, 15th of July for Melbourne. But I think it starts in Brisbane on the 9th and 10th, then to Melbourne, then uh, Auckland, I think on the 20th of July, then Sydney on the 21st to 23rd. And I think outside of Melbourne, there'll be a series of local events. It would be brilliant to meet some people. So I think the Crossroads story is quite interesting at this moment. And, you know, you know, all the action, let's face it, all of the actions in Australia now, really, you know, the, the brain drain from Crossrail, generally all the brands of Crossrail have headed to um, to Australia. And you think of all the four big cities of ANZ, they've all got programs that are kind of at the point where Crossrail went wrong. So I, I'm, not saying it, I'm not saying the Australian ones will go wrong, by the way, but I, I think it's just interesting to talk about it. So yeah, ninth of July to the 23rd of July. Yeah, I would really thank Public Transport Association and Australian Railway Association for organizing this event. People would love to hear from you, Mark. What an amazing journey it's been. Uh, Mark, before I let you go, can you please give us one piece of advice to our listeners? Um, well, safety, safety first, of course, safety first. O- authentic belief in safety is where all of this starts. Without that, you, you're not on the pitch. You, you're not, you're not playing if you aren't there. But assuming everybody gets that these days, I think it's this idea of you know the incomplete leader in the, in great uncertainty. It's okay not to know. The key thing is to work together on the whole and be very suspicious of anybody who tries to do the opposite. I break things down into smaller parts and autocratic leadership styles. So start with safety and then let's have a more authentic sophisticated leadership style and i think we'll win from that thank you mark thanks for sharing and uh, i'm excited that uh, you're gonna do your tour i wish all the best for your tour and uh, i'll make sure that i get to see you in person in sydney oh definitely and um, you enjoy your shortest cold day and i'll enjoy our longest warm day <laughs> <laughs> thanks mark bye all right. I believe everyone listening to this podcast has got something to take away from today's discussion. If you like this podcast, please listen, follow and share this podcast within your network. If you believe we should be sharing your story or someone within your network, there is a railway leader who should be here sharing his or her contribution to this industry. Contact me on railway transportation systems at gmail.com thank you for your time today 
See you next fortnight. Until then, stay safe and take care of yourself.